Today I'm happy to introduce D. Jin. He's the advanced development leader in the GM product cybersecurity organization, where he works with GM R&D and engineering teams. Prior to joining GM, he worked as the senior security technical specialist at Chrysler. He began his career as the lead security engineer at GM OnStar. He received his PhD from the University of Oklahoma in electrical engineering and computer engineering. Today, he will be giving us an introduction to the GM product cybersecurity organizations. Right. All right. So thank you, uh, Professor Maji, for the introduction. And thanks for the uh, serious invitation for me to come over here and present our GM product cybersecurity overview. I'm very pleased to come over here and I'm very excited to present what we are doing in, in, in the, the current effort. So the, the presentation today will cover various different topics within uh, cybersecurity at a fairly high level, uh, at a fairly high level. Uh, it will cover things like the cybersecurity ecosystem, the connected uh, uh, connectivity, increased connectivity, and also the attack surfaces, the, uh, the lack of uh, cybersecurity talents, our cybersecurity vulnerability disclosure programs, um, et cetera, et cetera. And also things like external, internal uh, development and uh, uh, ex external collaborations as such. Um, so the cybersecurity has become a really hot topic for pretty much all the industry. and. Uh, specifically for automotive industry, there has been a lot of news recently. If you follow some of the news, you, can, you will see, hear a lot of news and articles talking about automotive cybersecurity, not only GM, but basically the, the industry across the board. Um, you know, when you are in this cybersecurity business, you want to hear all the good news, which you know, some of those uh, Good things that happen uh, that GM has been working on are reported, and that's good. And uh, you don't want you to be in the sort of uh, the other spectrum. So the IoT really is the Internet of Everything right now, and a vehicle is part of the overall IoT system. So the the consumers around the world has constantly request. Uh, um, you know, constant connect connectivities to their devices and also uh, the uh, just a seamless connection uh, uh, feature and performance. So it's, it's pre predicted that by the year of 2020, there would be about 50 billion of connected devices uh, connected to the internet, which if you think about it is effectively about approximately seven devices per person on the earth, which is a huge amount. Um, so among some of the various type of uh, connected devices, only about 10 billion would be like your smartphones uh, and tablets. The rest are the machines that you typically don't see, but they are connected to each other and they are talking to each other. Things like the you know, various type of sensors, the uh, smart power meters, and uh, you know, things like that. There are a lot of other things like the uh, po point of sale and uh, ATM machines, just a, a lot of different various of things. So for GM, we recognize the need of product cybersecurity and we, we are the first automaker to have, to create a dedicated, a um, integrated, and a global organization for product cybersecurity. This centralized organization handles the, cybersecur the vehicle cybersecurity aspect of our whole product. So you can see that our, um, this is our world technical center, which is in Warren, Michigan, and our um, head, uh, corporate headquarter is in uh, Detroit, and specifically in the Renaissance Center uh, building. 
this is our core technical competency where, where it's at. We also have engineers in the Palo Alto team um, and GME in uh, Germany uh, and also Israel. We have our advanced technology center over there. We also have some other uh, affiliated engineers that are working in the Korea, in China, and uh, South America region. So it's, it's truly a global organization. So the organization was created uh, three, four years ago, started with a handful of engineers and, and uh, uh, managers, and now has grown into a team of over 80 uh, people, 80 internal experts on various different things. And the team will continue to grow over time. So, The uh, automotive industry nowadays is changing very fast in the last uh, five years than any given time in automotive history of the past 100 years. So our CEO actually uh, once upon a time said that she would expect there is more change in the next uh, five years than it has in the last 50 years. So you can see the dramatic change of the automotive space uh, will potentially pose some challenges in the cybersecurity area. Um, I can give you a couple of examples. So for example, in 2017, GM will have uh, its first vehicle that supports vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communication uh, capabilities. This is our 2017 Cadillac CTS. And another example is that we're, we're going to have a so-called super cruise capability on a 2017 uh, Cadillac CT6, which is our flag, uh, flagship uh, you know, sedan, luxury sedan. So the super cruise capability, what it is, is that it provides you a hands-free experience and capability on the divided highway it, it's gotten limitations. You, you got to be on the divided highway. It utilizes the advanced the GPS technology to first, making, to first make sure that you are actually on a divided highway. Otherwise, the system won't engage at all. So it also utilizes some other uh, advanced monitoring capability to um, make sure that the driver you know, pays attention as the, the vehicle is moving at a certain specific time interval to make, to make sure that the driver is constantly paying attention of the vehicle condition. Um, so this kind of echoes what our CEO uh, stated before. Um, so the GM OnStar has um, responded 1.3 billion button presses and customer requests over the past 20 years. Uh, OnStar first launched in uh, 1996, uh, which is the first of the, its kind in the, in the industry. And we are the in industry leader in the telematic space. Um, so uh, really, if you think about it, 1.3 billion uh, button press response, that's like a, every person in China or in India press the, the button once, which is uh, pretty significant. Um, <clears throat> our global volume will have 75% um, that's, that will have connectivity feature by the year of 2020. So which further demonstrated the increased connectivity feature of our current modern vehicles. So as you can see from the presentation slides, um, there are many different kinds of potential attack surfaces, right? If you kind of categorize it, it's gotten some, some of those are wired, some of those are wireless. And even for wireless, you've got short range and the longer range, right? So if we talk about, for example, the, uh, the wired connections, you got a USB port in the vehicle. Some, some vehicle has an SD card port. 
some still got a, a, a disc, a CD in it, and um, that's, that's wired. And the electrical vehicle charging station is also another thing that is, you know, connected to the vehicle. It connects to the smart the, to, the, to the power grid, um, and also, for example, you got um, phone pro projections, right? You have uh, the Google um, and uh, Android, Android, uh, uh, Android uh, Auto, and uh, the uh, Apple CarPlay. You can hook up your phone through a USB, and your phone screen will be projected onto the vehicle. I will later on show some picture of, of, of that. And that feature even can be executed through a wireless link. Um, and you also you have a DLC, so, called, so to speak, that's the date link connector, which essentially is the o OBD2 port, which is onboard diagnostics. So it serves as the purpose of, you know, for the service mechanics to diagnose what's wrong uh, with the vehicle. It is mandated by the legislation that you know every vehicle that's produced after the year of 1996 will have such a port. So um, um, now speaking of the wireless connections, you've gotten the uh, the Bluetooth, the uh, near field com communications, um, you've got Wi-Fi. You got the um, V2, V2V and the V2 vehicle to infrastructure, the SRC, the um, dedicated short range uh, communications. So this, these uh, communication channels are sort of uh, shorter range to medium range. Now, other than those, you, you've got the GPS, the Sirius XMs, um, the AM, FM radios, HD radios, you've got the cellular, 3G, 4G cellular networks. So those are longer range, which um, you know can enable a lot of uh, features that is very convenient. So <clears throat> the growth of the infotainment and telematics uh, um, features have introduced many wireless connections, and uh, as such, uh, the attack surface is increasing. So we are we need to do uh, a diligent work to make sure that you know those um, increased connectivities doesn't uh, produce a uh, security vulnerability. So now moving forward, um, I'd like to talk a little bit about the cybersecurity ecosystem. So our organization is the overall responsible for a end-to-end -end system. So from an end-to-end -end standpoint, we have the vehicle on the one end, and we have the back office that the vehicle is communicating with. And in between is the telematics channel that's sitting over there. So each one component, so to speak, will have its own characteristic and presents its own unique uh, cybersecurity risks. And uh, we need a, a, di a, a different set of tactics to, ha to handle and uh, tackle the cybersecurity problems. Um, so our team is composed of um, various different teams within our teams, some of which are, are working on the in-vehicle ECU security. Some of those are, are working on the connect connected ECU electronic control unit that will talk to the back end. And we also have a team that's focusing on secure the tele telecommunication part with our telecommunication partners. And we also have a dedicated IT, vehicle-facing IT security team. That's a little bit different from the traditional IT back office, uh, uh, you know, from the perspective that it's, it's vehicle um, facing is handling vehicle services and requests and things like that. So <clears throat> we are looking at the cybersecurity posture from an end-to-end -end perspective, and we are implementing defense in depth strategies to make sure that we have multiple layer of protections uh, to the whole ecosystem. In cybersecurity, there is no silver bullet 
for any kind of industry. So a, a better strategy is that we have, we got to put multiple layer uh, to protect our, our you know, core interest there. Um, <clears throat> so now let me go into a little bit detail to talk about these. Um, our cybersecurity team also has a dedicated red team uh, supporting our internal penetration testing, uh, which is very much needed. Uh, it's, a, it's a team of um, certified uh, ethical hacker um, that has great expertise in hacking embedded systems, cyber physical systems. They have great understanding of the whole ecosystem, how it works and how it's, putting, uh, it's put it together. So, <clears throat> um, we, as I mentioned before, we, all, we, we took the, the uh, defense in depth, and I will be speaking a little bit more in the following slide. Um, so, we do a, one step further. Now, in terms of defense in depth, in depth, you design a security solution from the very beginning of, uh, of building a car, right? build security, build vehicle with security in mind. Because security is, if you're patching it, that's, that's cost a whole lot more money, then it is built, it was built in in the beginning. So we took one step further to say, hey, we, we got a secure solution, but the, the cybersecurity landscape constantly changing, it's, it's, it's dynamic nature is, it's very much its nature because you know the attackers can become stronger day after day. We become stronger day after day as well. But we need to constantly constantly monitoring uh, what's going on in the vehicle, what's 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 sent from the vehicle to the back end and from back end to the vehicle. And uh, we need to detect if there is any sign of intrusion or anomaly. And we need to quickly respond to any event that is suspicious. So we've we built a, a our capability in detecting, monitoring, and responding to a cybersecurity event um, in our team. So Another thing that I'd like to mention is that um, the security dis, uh, vulnerability disclosure program, uh, which I will talk a little bit more in detail in the following slides, but GM has launched a um, disclosure program, started from uh, January this year, and uh, we have uh, received uh, ample amount of uh, um, submissions from the white hat hacker or white hat, white hat researcher, so to speak, the, uh, the research community. So many of which are IT, general IT related uh, issues and submissions. Um, a few of those are vehicle related uh, submissions and our team is working diligently to uh, assess the issue, to talk to the researchers constantly, to understand better what the issue was and to come up with a solution to address any potential concerns over there. So, um, and also, in addition to that, GM really views cybersecurity not as a uh, competitor advantage. Um, so we really view it as not a collaborative one, uh, uh, a competitor advantage. Um, but as a systemic concern that the whole industry um, needs to be, you know, um, needs to pay attention. And ultimately, the whole industry serves a collection of customers, which is the society, um, can only be better served if we work collaboratively to fight against the, the hackers. Um, so <clears throat> we joined the Automotive ISAC, Information Sharing 
um, and Analysis Center, which is a group of s uh, automotive OEMs all together. There are now uh, 15 OEMs participating, which covers 98% of all the light duty vehicles in the North America. So that effort has uh, took off and uh, now a lot of involvements. People, so the intent of that is the auto ISAC is that people will become, or OEMs or the automotive industry become more open in collaborating with each other um, to identify the potential trends of the cybersecurity um, you know, um, effort, so to speak, and to identify the potential cybersecurity intelligence to share with the whole community to benefit each other so, just so that everybody is aware and everybody is thinking about how do we do better. Um, so, which comes back to the point where, you know, cybersecurity is not a competitive advantage, but everybody needs to work together collaboratively to address the issue. Um, it takes more than a single entity to work on cybersecurity to improve our overall industry cybersecurity posture. Um, we have uh, built uh, strong relationships with uh, external groups um, of uh, researchers, of you know, standardization activities uh, with the universities, etc. So. Um, All right, so as the technology are enhancing and the, the entry point of, to the vehicle are increasing, so the attacker has gotten more potential place to play around with, to play with around. Um, so GM is focusing on protecting the customers from the standpoint of the three major categories we protect the anti-theft of vehicles, um, and we protect hacker from tampering the vehicle. Our customers' safety is our number one priority of the cooperation, and we are very serious about the privacy of the customer data and data privacy, data data security. We also um, um, prevent use of harmful softwares and making sure that there is no counterpart, uh, counterfeit part into our supply chain. Um, so this is a more of a, you know, the motivation of our cybersecurity efforts. And we sell a lot of cars worldwide under different brand. I'm sure everybody here are pretty familiar with the, the first of four. Um, this is our GM Oppo um, brand. And this is uh, the um, Vauxhall, which is primarily focusing on the England area. And this is a uh, Holden, New Zealand, Australia. This is uh, a Baldwin, Wuling, and uh, FAW. This Primarily is a joint venture um, activity with, uh, I think, uh, China. So our joint venture actually produces almost a half of the volume of our world worldwide volume. So which represents a significant part of our our sales. Um, okay, now let's talk about the motivations of the adversaries. So there are primarily two types of attacks, right? If you think about focusing on the vehicle side, you got the infiltration of the vehicle and uh, cause to influence the vehicle behavior. You got the data exfiltration, which can potentially pull the you know data in the vehicle out and make use of that. So there has been a lot of work being done by the enthusiasts and the white hat hackers and the researchers in this space. And um, the work has been going on for a while. So our view of the adversary categories 
are the following, the enthusiasts, the hackers, the hacktivism, uh, the entrepreneurs, the organized crime, industry, and competitors, and nation states. So each different adversary has its different goals and motivations. And so far, you know, what if we draw a line so far, then primarily it's, it's right here. The white hat hacker is where the current state is at. Um, so a lot of collaborations are, are happening in this space between the OEMs and the uh, open research community. So now let's talk a little bit about the, uh, a, a bit detailed, but not so detailed, the uh, defense in depth strategy. So we have to secure the external and internal, per, internal of the vehicle to make it a layered method. And uh, the attacker must uh, be able to <laughs> overcome the different layers to get the crown jewel. And we are, we, are going, we are making it very hard for the attackers to do that. So, and again, to reiterate, the ability to monitor, detect, and response is, is very critical in this. Um, the uh, Security Vulnerability Disclosure Program. So GM is actually the first major auto, automotive OEMs that has this program. And it started, uh, as I said, January 2016. Um, so we have seen a lot of uh, good collaborations with uh, the researchers. And uh, the team is dil diligently um, dealing with the issues and uh, uh, talking to the researchers and to um, get the issue uh, fixed and closed. So. We collaborate with uh, HackerOne, which is uh, a service provider, uh, disclosure service provider over there. And um, um, the port, uh, we have a portal on the HackerOne. And if you, can, if you want to search, you can search HackerOne GM. That will probably bring you to, uh, to there. So why is it important? Because the cybersecurity is one of our top priorities, and we really want to make sure that the customer is safe and their data is secure and our product is safe. So um, by having this disclosure program, that will keep us um, up to date on what the latest research has represented and uh, to keep us working on improving our cybersecurity posture over time. So, and it also helps us to maintain our leadership's uh, position in the product cybersecurity area. Um, we can um, also identify potential collaborative relationship with the researchers. So it, was very, it, it is very successful to date. Okay, now let's talk a little bit about the challenges that the automaker is facing in the cybersecurity space. So the typical automo automobile has a pretty long life cycle. We, we, are, now uh, we are now now designing a vehicle five years down the road, and uh, the vehicle will be on the road for another 10, 20, 20 50, 10, probably 10, 11. I heard this, the, 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 the average statistic is like the vehicles are on the road for 11 years or something like that. So you could see a, long, a lot of the vehicles that are even older than that on the road. So to protect vehicles that, that were designed 10 years ago is a different story than protecting vehicles that are newly built. So it's, it's, um, it's just a the nature of the long product life cycle pose a potential, cha potential challenge on maintaining a higher level cybersecurity on the older cars. Um, 
the technology differences between the commercial, the, the consumer and the vehicle electronics is another um, challenge. Um, let me give you an example. So if, in, in Michigan, if you leave your, car, your, your smartphone in the car parked in your garage overnight, the next morning when you enter the car picking up your phone, what happened? The battery is dead, right? So there is, the battery cannot withstand that kind of temperature. But for vehicle, we, are, we have to design vehicle with very stringent requirement, environmental requirement, such as hot, cold, uh, you know, moisture, uh, humidity, vibration, all of those. So which puts a lot of constraints on how the vehicle can be built and how the vehicle, what, in what condition the vehicle can, can run. So if, if we park a car, you know, during the night in the winter, the next morning, the car battery is dead, then it's not acceptable. And as a matter of fact, the car has to withstand some temperature like minus 50. Um, and we have to make sure not only it works, but it will continue to work in that situation. So the, it, it puts a different constraints on the vehicle than the consumer electronics. Um, complexity. Complexity is, is a enemy of security, so to speak. Um, the, the more complex that the system is, then the, the more difficult it is to make it secure. Um, for example, the, the cars in, the, in 2000 only have a one million lines of code in the, in the vehicle. Now the, the Chevy Volt that, that's introduced in uh, 2010 has 10 million code, line of code, um, which is even more than a F-35 fighter jet. Nowadays, the vehicle on average has 100 million of code, which is, if you think about it, it's, it's amazing. It's much more than a lot of other things you can think of. The, the, the Boeing of, uh, 747, uh, the fighter jets, it, it's, it's a lot more than that, and it's, gonna, it's going to increase to 200 million line of codes in the near future. So the, which adds a lot of complexity to the vehicles. You can almost uh, say that the vehicle now, it, nowadays is, is running on ones and zeros. Almost you can say that. Um, so another thing is that really the cybersecurity talents is far less than what's needed. The talents are you guys, which is why GM participated the uh, joint series this year into the program and uh, trying to uh, collaborate with the Purdue and to, uh, moving, to move forward the educational program to help Purdue to produce more cybersecurity talents especially in, uh, in the cyber physical space, IoT space, and uh, aut automotive specific is the best. Um, but um, um, Purdue has a long history of uh, the uh, cybersecurity excellence, which is recognized, and that's, one, that's, that's why we, we choose Purdue to collaborate with. Um, <coughs> All right, <laughs> autonomous is another very hot word. As a matter of fact, I have my colleagues, uh, Mike Imo here, who is the uh, autonomous uh, uh, cybersecurity um, group manager over here supporting me and uh, uh, in this presentation. I'm glad that uh, Mike made it. <laughs> so autonomous vehicle is, uh, is a pose a, another set of challenges, right? It shapes from the human to the software to get an input of you know, the, the situation the vehicle is running and then have to make a decision uh, in real time 
to, um, to make sure that the system I is driving safely. So it puts a lot, a lot more security and a robustness requirement, uh, even higher requirement on those um, properties. And uh, autonomous vehicles blends traditional automotive electronics uh, with IT, sy IT system-like devices. So the traditional IT, uh, traditional vehicle um, ECUs, you can think of as a embedded system for the most part. It's gotten limited uh, computational power and uh, memory space and uh, the resources that you can run and build security on versus the the other opposite, which is the IT, you know, generally you, you, you've got a lot, of, a lot more resources to work on. So how to, how to make sure the, the heterogeneous state of the vehicle and how to have a cybersecurity solution that accounts for the various difference of the capability of the system is, is a challenge. And you, you've got, the autonomous vehicle also has LiDAR, which is a light and, um, um, which is a light uh, uh, distance and the ranging and the radar, the radio distance and the ra ranging, the camera, da camera data coming into from the sensor. So it's, it's a lot more inputs that the vehicle is, is getting. And each one will be will have its own characteristic, and will it needs its own cybersecurity solution to secure it. So, and also the 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 physical security aspect of the occupant uh, cabin requires additional cybersecurity measures. Now you have all the sensors, lidar, radar, cameras. It's outside of the vehicle. And you have to think about how to make it strong to protect from tampering, compromising physically of the part. So those are some of the newer concerns in the automotive, in, in the autonomous driving um, uh, space. Okay, now it's you, the skills and opportunities. So our team is a really diverse team and we, we've gotten, um, engineers, electrical engineers, system engineers with uh, cybersecurity backgrounds, with uh, cryptography backgrounds, and uh, traditional IT uh, backgrounds, the security architecture, program management, uh, R&D, and even uh, hacking, as I mentioned in the beginning. So it's, it's, uh, this is just uh, some examples, uh, skills that's, that's going to be needed for a successful uh, cybersecurity engineer, uh, for an engineer to be successful. Now, um, there, are, there are a whole lot more other skills that will be you know, needed or developed when you are working in the space, um, such as collaborative uh, uh, skills, communication skills, et cetera, et cetera. So, which is typical to uh, most of the, the other jobs as well. So we see a, a, a lack of the talents in this space. And um, um, we hope the universities can uh, do a little bit more in, in, the in the education of embedded systems, security, autonomous, uh, automotive, v automotive systems, and uh, embedded system security and just uh, promote the understanding of these different systems and prepare the talents to be ready to, uh, to get into the workforce. So some of our openings are, um, this, this is just uh, you know, some of our current openings. Um, we, we've got engineers, we, we need the PMs, program managers, we need the researchers, and we also have internship openings for uh, uh, next year. So if, if any of these, in the previous slides, if any of those uh, you know, interest you, please talk to me and Mike afterwards. Uh, we'd like you to, we'd like to understand a bit better of your interest and uh, your um, 
qualifications and So some of the advanced research topic that we are, we are um, doing right now, which will need your help eventually, are like remote attestation, which the, uh, the back end could know at any given moment what is the software that's running on the vehicle is there any new malware that wasn't supposed to be on the vehicle that is currently present? And by remote attestation, we could detect that. But how do we make it more efficient it is essentially the core issue. And intelligent uh, intrusion detection systems and the intrusion prevention system, how do we make it more smart, right? make it smarter? Uh, we, we could use machine learning, artificial intelligence to, to be the brain to make a decision um, how, whether that's an intrusion or not. I mean, it's, it's monitoring is basically simulating the brain. Sometimes the brain can handle things that are fuzzy and then still make a good decision, but it's very difficult, difficult for the vehicles or for any, anything machine because uh, it, it's not as good as uh, the human brain yet. Cyber forensics, uh, higher, higher assurance architecture, um, non-cryptographic uh, security solutions such as the physical layer security or using physical properties to um, enhance security, such as anti-jamming, you can use the power you know, consumption of, of a hardware to to tell whether it's, it has uh, unintended function embedded into the hardware as a hardware trojan or something like that. And the sensor anti-spoofing is another thing that is uh, critical to the autonomous driving, uh, autonomous driving vehicles and uh, applications of uh, potential artificial intelligence into the cybersecurity. So I'm pretty much coming to the end of my presentation. And uh, um, oh, here are a couple of things. So you know, this is, I hope it's your next car. Um, we have a Chevy. Uh, this is a little bit off for some reason, the picture. Um, our Chevy uh, Bolt EV is the first electrical vehicle that crack to crack the code of you know affordability together with a 200 mile plus driving range so uh, it, it's, it's good and um, our uh, Buick vehicles our GMC uh, trucks and SUVs our Cadillac luxury brand and I want to also talk a little bit about Maven just. So it is estimated that right now there is 15 million of people who are using the right sharing or car sharing. And GM basically combined a couple of different programs and made it into a Maven brand. So this is our uh, brand of uh, sharing. And um, we, we are operating a in a half a dozen, now it's probably more than that, uh, U.S. cities. And uh, we're, we also have prisons in, um, in Germany, in China, Brazil, and more to come. So this shows you the interior of our Cadillac, and you can see the 3D uh, you know, map over there. And this one, as I promised, you can see the, the Apple CarPlay there and a few more interiors. Now is really the end of my presentation. So any questions or comments, uh, I'm happy to, uh, to take. Yes. Yeah, I have a couple of questions. One is, when you have these um, big thunderstorms, how does it affect the capability of GPS communication with your car? Does it interrupt it in a way, or 
when you have the big thunderstorm. A big uh, uh, thunderstorm? Yes. Uh -huh. Oh, okay. Uh, well, I'm not sure that I'm, I'm the expert to, to answer that question, but uh, GP... But, but, but are you asking that from a security perspective? No, or, I mean, well, you can say you are driving a car, all of a sudden there is some kind of a big thunderstorm, and if it is autonomous, uh, basic car, it's going to come some, cause some accident, and all of a sudden, basically, there's a pileup or something. So that's one concern. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. So the, the GPS is, is my understanding. I'm not an expert on the GPS, mm -hmm. uh, but it's my understanding that the GPS now is, is pretty reliable. It can, in many ca cases, it can battle against the bad weather. That's one. And the vehicle also has a data reckoning capability where if you lost, for example, if you lost the GPS signal, if you're in, in a tunnel, the vehicle, the, that, uh, that reckoning algorithm can still know where your vehicle location is and predict your, um, your, your, your trip or your route. And also the vehicle has, init um, what's it called, init initial uh, measurement uh, uh, module, um, IMU, which know it has it's gotten its zero it into it, it knows where you are, your you know your relative position of the vehicle and things like that. So all of this could help in this situation. It, it's my understanding because it's not really my area. Do you have anything? So the, if you, you mentioned autonomous, the vehicle is not going to be driven with GPS. It's going to be driven by all of that other sensor data. Yeah, because they're controlling the, basically the location with respect to the other cars. Um, that's one thing that you're going to basically consider because that's one thing. And the other thing that I'm concerned about is the amount of these um, frequencies that uh, have, done, have they done any studies on how, because like the noise, noise noise pollution, this is going to be becoming uh, frequency pollution and there are some people maybe they have some different devices in their bodies and maybe the other devices and all of a sudden if there's some disruption or something, do, do they con have they done anything on in that regard, regard not just the human being because there are also the other animals and maybe we know that there are some of these uh, mammals in the sea, they get affected by the communications of the basically submarines and mm -hmm. some of the other things so I, I think he's telling us that uh, Greenpeace is going to come after us and start uh -huh. suing General Motors no I'm not saying that I say <laughs> basically forecasting or basically being concerned about what's going to happen next yeah. because you can do everything and all of a sudden you're going to be in somewhere that it gets out of control so yeah. it, I don't know if you, yeah I know we're li very limited on the government tells us what bands of, of ranges we can be in I don't, I don't know if we've if you, if you know of any areas where we've really tested the limits of that and how much noise is too much noise. I, I well, much I, I guess that. this is kind of outside of our area, yeah. right? Because, you know, within GM, I, you know, we, we definitely have a team to cover that. But I, I will be happy to, uh, you know, write down your questions and, mm -hmm. you know, get an answer for you offline. Um, I'm just saying these are some ideas which come to mind when you think about them because there's some of the things which poses some concern mm -hmm. of what's going to happen. Because everybody, is, everybody sees the good thing, oh, we're going to do this and this and that, and then all of a sudden, oh, how, how come this happened? Mm -hmm. so, okay. Yeah, thank you. Yep. I have a question, uh, security versus safety trade-off. So if, let's say, to provide integrity, we sign messages and we use certificates for parties authentication, it will take time to validate certificates, to verify signatures, and then it imposes overhead so that the message is delivered with delay to the mechanism, to brakes or to the engine. Uh, what do you think about that trade-off? Mm. And my second question uh, about secure programming techniques which you use in the company. You mentioned that the firmware of mo modern vehicle is more than one million lines of code then probably you use some static analysis, static code analysis tools, memory protection tools to prevent bugs, buffer overflows in that code. Yeah. 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 Okay. Good question. So uh, let, let me try to address uh, both of them and uh, Mike can uh, help. 
So the, um, the cybersecurity and safety is not conflicting to each other. The cybersecurity is supporting and supplementing the security part of it, the, the, the safety part of it. We are making the vehicle more secure by uh, leveraging the cybersecurity mechanisms. So you talk about the, uh, the code signing, uh, the certificate, and, and all the things like that, which potentially adds a little bit of uh, overhead and potentially adds a bit of uh, delay. But we are making it in a way, in a way such that it won't cause the, uh, a, a huge delay that will impact the safety critical systems. So there are still solutions out there you know, to, to make it uh, harmoniously work. Um, and also, for example, the, the lightweight uh, cryptographic algorithms, you can still make it strong enough and yet efficient enough and don't cause overhead to potentially influence the safety aspect of it. So that's uh, for, for, the, for our next question. Dee, I'll just add one more oh, yeah. thing you said there. So, so to, to Dee, what Dee's comment is, is we still, we're still bound by the same requirements that we were before cybersecurity was in the picture. Mm. Just like you said, that message for breaks or whatever that has to go across the bus. It has to get processed just as fast as mm. it did before. So to Dee's point, you know, we're, adding, we're adding more horsepower, we're adding hardware accelerators to, mm. to do that quick cryptography and still meet the, meet the time requirements. But we're not adjusting any of our performance requirements. Mm. We're not allowed to adjust any of our performance mm. requirements just because we're adding security because mm. that'll come right back to us, right? Well, you, you can't make our cars work if you're adding this security. So we're bound by those requirements still. Mm. Yeah, to, to your second question, sure. Those are some of the best practices that, uh, that's recognized by the industry and as a matter of fact, uh, different various entities are, are uh, su suggesting and recommending and they issue guidelines such as the SEE J3061. They have uh, the cybersecurity uh, guidebooks recommending you have to, you know, it's recommended that you take the, the processes uh, to make the, um, your development, uh, you know, a life cycle secure to implement, to utilize static and dynamic, dynamic code analysis tools uh, constantly at, at the code check, check in and then the next day you're going to address all the warnings identified by the tools and uh, you know do it next time when you check in again run the tool so um, yes those are some of our best practices that are being uh, employed yep any other Questions? So with, with devices that we have right now, I have the privilege of saying, sorry. So with devices we have right now, I have the privilege of saying, do not track my location, or do not, uh, do not send out a signal to this particular. I can control what, what apps can track, track my location or what apps can learn what uh, information about me. Do you think as automotives you can afford to give the user the privilege of saying that for this duration or on these days I don't want you to track my location, I want to be offline, does that, is that a privilege you can afford to give the users or is that something that would contradict with the entire purpose of having an autonomous system? Yeah, I want to hear you answer this question. <laughs> I don't know. I have, a, I, have a, <laughs> I have a good answer for that. It's sort of a, outside of my uh, expertise. So I, I would have to defer that question to some of our internal experts on that. Um, yeah, I, so. I, mean, I, I can't answer it either because it's a, it's a, it's a messy legal question, right? But, but to, to opt out, anybody can opt out of OnStar, right? And I, I guess it would be the same thing here. If you want to opt out of of being tracked because of you know some service that General Motors wants to buy, that's fine. Where it gets sticky now is, all right, GM knows that there's a, a vulnerability out there and it's attacking uh, vehicles in the greater Seattle area or whatever. We're gonna eventually get to that point. What do we do, right? If, you, if we think you might be over there, should we force the update to you? I know it's a whole legal discussion now that we're trying to have. If, you know, all privacy gets involved, and yeah, it's 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 messy. Yeah, so 
No, no telling where that's going to go yet. Good question. All right. Any? Let's thank the speaker. All right. Thank you.